Welcome to chapter two. So this one we previewed uh, the a little bit of the physics of breathing with chapter one when we talked about negative pressure being generated because of our diaphragm moving down, right? We contract our diaphragm, it moves down, therefore there's more suction that cre gets created in your pleural space and that suction then pulls the lungs open and then as the lungs open the volume of the lungs increases which means the pressure inside the lungs decreases. That's Boyle's law as volume increases, pressure decreases. Therefore, we have negative pressure in our lungs compared to the atmosphere and gas will flow in, right? And so we're gonna get a little bit more into the physics as we go through chapter two and chapter four. So just sort of hang on with there. It gets a little deep, but hopefully it all comes together a little bit easier. Uh, the more we talk about it. So we're looking at pressure and ventilation, and this is looking at more specifically how we breathe. So this is less than a straight anatomy and more, how does the breath really get in, right? How do we do this? And you might ask yourself, why are we gonna go into a lot of detail on this? Like, why am I going to be abused going over all this information? Well, when we're talking about life support, when we talk about mechanical ventilation, this is gonna be primarily how we're going to get someone to breathe to maintain their life function. So this lecture here will give you the basics of running life support, right? It's not gonna make let you be able to go out tomorrow and run one, but the idea here is to give you the basics of what's going on with the lungs physiologically as someone breathes without a machine, and then we'll talk a little bit what goes on physiologically for someone to breathe when they're on the machine. So we'll look at those differences and it's going to be important especially when we talk about how blood pressure can be affected with positive pressure ventilation. So these are all going to be very very crucial uh, lectures for you just to get that basic understanding. It's like hey understanding how an engine works. You understand how an engine works then you'll be a lot easier to diagnose it a lot easier to take care of that engine. So same thing here, the more you understand about how we breathe naturally, as well as what changes when we put someone on positive pressure ventilation, the better you will become all together at thinking through how to fix a situation. So let's look just straight at the beginning. What is the primary function of the lungs? Well, the whole thing here is gas exchange. That's considered the primary function. And we all know they have other function as well. Uh, they have limb tissue. They have all this other stuff that they do as well. Uh, but the primary function over all that organ is going to be, right, exchanging gas, exchanging oxygen into the bloodstream and then getting, I don't know, CO2 out of the bloodstream, right? That's the whole idea here, right? Is to get that sort of exchange of gas happening across that membrane. So we need to exchange those gases to let our life processes, our metabolic processes continue on. If we starve the body of oxygen, then we're gonna create uh, anaerobic metabolism and we're gonna have more CO2 be, be created. And then we're gonna have an issue where uh, acid builds up in our bloodstream. And ultimately, just like anything else that's living, if the pH balance is too far off, it doesn't go well for the rest of the that life form's function. So, so that's one of the things that we'll be looking at here. That's why we draw um, blood from an artery and look at pH and all these things because we're looking at how well the body exchanges gas what both both oxygen and CO2 when we put people on mechanical ventilation one of the first things that you're going to get either before or right after you put them on mechanical ventilation is going to be a, a blood sample from an artery usually and this is going to look at the pH, the CO2, and oxygen levels of their bloodstream. And that's going to help us see how severe or non-severe the situation is. And so the primary function of the lungs is to be exchanging oxygen and CO2 between the bloodstream and the lung tissue, right? This is accomplished with movement of gas, right? We need the diaphragm to contract. We need the pleural space to create that negative pressure to allow the lungs to expand. So that way we have bigger volume and therefore less pressure. Therefore, we're gonna create a pressure gradient between our alveoli and the atmosphere and breathe in, right? So we need the functions of the body 
to create that environment that will lend itself to better breathing. And when people are working hard to breathe, when they're using those accessory muscles that we talked about at the end of the last chapter, it's going to make it a lot harder for them to have effective ventilation because those muscles, they're also skeletal muscles. And the more they use those, especially if they have a severe pneumonia or anything like that, the more prone they are to fatigue. And ultimately, that fatigue, when that fatigue sets in, their CO2 levels start to rise and their oxygen levels start to decrease. So we're going to have a lot of issues there. So we need to create that negative pressure. We need to be able to have that free flowing gas into and out of our lungs. So what's our role here? Well, this is pretty darn important here. Our role is to make sure our patient ventilates effectively. So let me give you a situation here. We got a patient and they overdosed on narcotics, right? So I'm giving you a scenario. Why do I need to know this? Okay, let's say you have a patient and you're working in an emergency room that comes in and they were overdosed on narcotics. Well, if someone's overdosed on narcotics, they're breathing very shallow, right? Very shallow, maybe a respiratory rate of like eight, right? Something very shallow and infrequent. So they're not breathing very deeply. So are they getting rid of CO2 if they're not breathing deeply? No, right? So their CO2 is climbing. Well, what do you guys know? You guys probably went over this in regular AMP. Uh, the hemoglobin molecule is where oxygen and CO2 sort of attached to it. Uh, so if my CO2 in my red blood cell keeps climbing, how much room on that red blood cell do you think there's going to be to park oxygen on there? Right? If there's no room, if all the parking spaces are taken up by CO2, 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 then there's no parking spaces for oxygen. In other words, if your patient's not breathing, they're not going to be able to get oxygen into and hang on to the hemoglobin molecule so that oxygen can be delivered to your body. So therefore, if someone retains a lot of CO2, if someone were to not breathe, if someone were to put a plastic bag over someone's ma mouth, it's going to make it hard for CO2 to get out. It's going to make a CO2 build up. And as CO2 increases, oxygen levels decrease. So if someone's not breathing, their CO2 will go up and their oxygen levels will go down, right? This is universal, this is time after time. So one of the things that we like to make sure to do here is make sure our patient has good, adequate ventilation. Ventilation, remember, is removing CO2 and replacing it with oxygen. So we need to make sure that our patients ventilate. Well, that's good, right? That's one of our primary roles. Is our patient exchanging gas appropriately? Right? Are they able to get the CO2 out of their system? Are they able to get the oxygen to their system? That's great, okay? But let me also submit to you what our other role is in this situation. One of our other roles in this situation is to make sure that we optimize cardiovascular function. So we can get as much oxygen into their bloodstream as we possibly can. We can get rid of as much CO2 uh, in their lungs as much as possible. But if the heart's not healthy enough to pump it, to, to pump the blood, to send the blood that has the oxygen to my tissues, including my brain, then it's worthless, right? We need the heart to beat. We need that pump to work to distribute the oxygen, to distribute the CO2 from the tissues to the lungs. So we need that heart to beat not only for distributing oxygen to our body, but also for getting CO2 from our tissues out of our lungs, out of our system, so we don't go into a very acidic pH situation, right? CO2 is a carbonic acid when we're looking at this. So our role is not only to optimize ventilation, and it's also to look at their cardiovascular function and how can we support their cardiovascular function right? If they're hypovolemic, right? If there's low blood volume, are they, do they have something like a GI bleed going on? Is there a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm going on? Is there something going on that's impeding 
blood flow from moving, like massive vasoconstriction? Is there um, is there something that's causing bl blood flow just to be distributed in places it shouldn't be, like a patient being in shock, right? Massive vasodilation, right? Where the blood vessels are just not in their toned state. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into what we do, and you will get there, trust me, but part of it is ventilation and distributing it with our heart. And we're gonna look at some calculations when we get to uh, later on, all right? Don't get yourself uh, too heavy into calculations yet, but later on we're going to get into calculations that help us determine how do we know if it's the heart that's causing our issues in the patient's body, or how do we know if it's the lungs, and how do we know if, if their metabolic rate's too high or too low, right? So all those things we'll get to, but I'm going to help you here with just looking at our basic roles is ventilation and cardiovascular function or optimizing cardiovascular function. So that way we can get oxygen to our tissues and CO2 out, both with ventilation and with cardiovascular function. So what does ventilation really mean? Well, this is a definition. This is the process of exchanging gas between the outside environment and the alveoli, right? That's the most basic definition. The whole idea here is to get as much oxygen into the alveoli as we can, right? It's that whole, and this is a much better picture than I can draw, getting that whole oxygen into the alveoli. Once it's in there, the oxygen will actually knock off the CO2 off the hemoglobin molecule, and we'll talk about that later on with the Haldane and Bohr, and I already have those resources under course resources if you're interested in reading ahead on that. But when we're looking at this, we'll actually have that exchange, that parking spot exchange, right? If you're in a parking lot, someone's pulling out, well, you know exactly where you're gonna pull in, right? With the parking spot. So same thing here, it's this massive game of who gets to park on the the hemoglobin molecule. And so we need to get oxygen into the alveoli and get CO2 out of the alveoli. So ultimately, ventilation is the bulk movement of gas in and out, right? This is the bulk movement of gas into, with a breath in and oxygen and out with some CO2, right? This is gonna be a big thing. Well, you might ask yourself, uh, okay, that's great. How do I know how much oxygen is actually getting in? Or how do I optimize how much oxygen is getting in? Well, there are some things that we can look at and we can actually calculate how much oxygen is in your alveoli to see what your concentration of oxygen is there. And you guys almost guarantee it, you have gone over this in your math class already, math and science class, would be the alveolar air equation, right? I can see how much oxygen is getting there, right? We're looking at FiO2, then we'll have barometric pressure, minus 47, and then we're going to subtract CO2. We'll change to purple here. CO2 times 1.25. Okay. So, when I'm doing this, I am eliminating, notice that the, you subtract that whole second part, you're subtracting CO2 times 1.25. So that means I'm eliminating CO2 in my alveoli. I just wanna see how much oxygen gets to my alveoli. So just mathematically, I'm eliminating CO2. Well, when I'm looking at FiO2 and barometric pressure, Right? If I'm looking at how much pressure there is behind the gas and how much concentration of gas there is here, that's what I'm looking at is how much ultimately is getting down into my lungs or into my alveoli so I can actually participate in external respiration. So when we're looking at this, let me ask you this. Your patient um, is breathing normally, but their oxygen levels are low. What are two things you could do to increase the oxygen concentration in their alveoli? Well, you're looking at it here. You actually already know. You just don't know you know it yet. You can increase their FiO2. What will that do to the amount of oxygen that gets to their alveoli? Well, as long as there's not something blocking it from getting there, it should increase it. What if I increase the amount of pressure? right? Remember, these are multiplied ultimately, FiO2 and barometric pressure or pressure altogether. If I increase pressure with breathing, right? If I give more pressure, then I can actually increase the diffusion capabilities of the oxygen that's already there. 
Isn't that crazy? I, I, both of those factors are going to be big parts of what we do. Now, both of those are great. I can increase pressure. I can increase the concentration of oxygen. But if my CO2 level is high, I won't be able to do anything with getting that oxygen onto the hemoglobin molecule. That's why the alveolar air equation, which has FiO2, pressure, and CO2 a part of it, uh, actually gives us information of how do we get more oxygen to someone's bloodstream. Well, if their CO2 levels are high, we're going to get rid of it. That's why it's minus CO2 times 1.25. So I would start there. I would make them breathe more effectively. If I make them breathe more effectively, then I don't have to adjust for pressure ventilation. I don't have to adjust for oxygen concentration. I, I know it's a little deep there, but <laughs> bringing in some math, Oh heavens, but when you're looking at this, I want you to sort of see the application of something just like the alveolar air equation. Now at the bedside, when we're taking care of a patient that has low oxygen levels in their bloodstream, you know you have this tool to actually see or a tool that will give you a hint on things that we can do to get more oxygen to their bloodstream. We could either increase FiO2, we can increase the amount of pressure we're giving them to help with diffusion, or we can get rid of CO2. All three of those will be able to help get more oxygen into the bloodstream. And you already know this, right? You already learned the alveolar air equation. So expect me to um, ask you to calculate this and to use it for the exam two right no surprises there right this is something you've already gone over and so i'm expecting you to be able to to go through the alveolar air equation and calculate it not only that but hey it's great that you know how to calculate it but what does it mean well here's a practical application of what it means i if, if i just do nothing but remember what the calculation is then i know three ways to get more oxygen into someone's bloodstream so what do we need to know about ventilation and breathing, right? So the big thing we've already talked a lot about is what do these all have in common, right? They're all looking at things that involve suction, right? A wound back, leeches, an air evacuation system, <laughs> a range over a stove, right? We're going to use some negative pressure, and that's going to be primarily the way you breathe. And that's actually the most effective way for your lungs and your chest wall to expand is by using negative pressure. When we put someone on positive pressure, and we'll get into further detail here in a bit, it changes a lot of things and can really have a lot of side effects that are associated with it. So ultimately, it's not the most effective thing to do when we put someone on a ventilator, but it's way better than if their negative pressure system breaks down. So that's where positive pressure comes in, right? All these things have positive pressure, blowing a balloon, bubbles, right? Even, even free willy down there, right? So all these things are pushing positive pressure. So if our negative pressure system fails, then we're going to use positive pressure. That we're going to have to expand the lungs a different way. If we can't expand the lungs with the chest wall, with normal diaphragmatic movement, then we'll have to use positive pressure. We'll have to get gas in there. And even in your lungs, and we'll talk about this, uh, we'll go to equilibrium, but there's still more positive pressure during negative pressure ventilation. We talked about this already, how when the lungs recoil, when you're about to exhale, the lungs will recoil, right? Your diaphragm stops contracting, right? So here is your diaphragm. It stops contracting and it moves up, right? Therefore, the volume in your lungs decreases, right? And as the container decreases, what happens to the pressure inside of a container? As we squeeze all those molecules together, it creates positive pressure, right so that positive pressure then we have more positive pressure in our lung tissue than we have in the atmosphere and gas will be forced out so you still have some positive pressure that goes on during your normal breathing like what you're doing right now so don't think that it's only with artificial devices like CPAPs or ventilators it's also something that your body's creating right now that exchange between positive and negative pressure we need that push-pull system if we're going to be healthy so let's talk about some basic concepts on pressure. Pressure is considered a force, right? A force is a weight or mass per unit of area. So the units of pressure 
include millimeters of mercury, uh, torticellis or tor for short, and centimeters of water pressure. So here's the situation. I want you guys to look at millimeters and tor um, closely. So a lot of people will use these two interchangeably. I want you to understand uh, that as far as the current recording of this lecture, uh, this will be used interchangeably with the board exams for um, our profession. So if they say that their CO2 level is 30 tor, they mean 30 millimeters of mercury. They think that they are or they're assuming that they're synonymous. However, there are some scientific studies out there that show there's a slight difference between tor and millimeters of mercury. So when we're talking about this, you'll see me use millimeters of mercury a lot versus saying the word tor or anything like that. But however, be aware if you do see tor or you hear someone talking in the respiratory field about uh, their CO2 is 20 tor or their oxygen level is 80 tor, they are they're thinking that tor and millimeters of mercury are synonymous. Um, so when we're looking at that, those two are usually lumped together. So I just want you to sort of see that. They're using it as alternating terms for the same thing. Then centimeters of water pressure, this is what we as respiratory therapists mostly use. When we talk about millimeters of mercury, hey, when you take someone's blood pressure, what's the unit on that, right? 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, right? That's what we're usually using there. But however, when we talk life support, when we talk mechanical ventilation, we're usually talking, hey, I'm gonna give someone 20 centimeters of water. We're gonna give them five centimeters of water. So we're gonna usually use the centimeters of water pressure units with positive pressure ventilation. So why? Well, I just circled this whole thing. Uh, one centimeter water pressure, right? Uh, one millimeter of mercury equals 1.36 centimeters of water. I'll repeat that again. One millimeter of mercury equals 1.36 centimeters of water pressure. So what does that mean? Which one's more sensitive? So let me ask you this in a different way. If I had go from two millimeters of mercury to four millimeters of mercury. Okay, this is millimeters of mercury. I'll just try to draw an M there. And then over here, I go from two centimeters of water pressure, so I'll put a C, to four centimeters of water pressure. Which one moved a greater amount of distance? They both moved two units. But which one moved a smaller amount? Which one had more movement and which one had less movement? Right, so one of these is going to be more sensitive, right? I'm going to have a lot more sensitivity, right? I'm gonna have a lot more sensitivity if I use centimeters of water pressure, right? Because there's more movement with a, a smaller numerical or a smaller integer changed. There's such there's so much more movement with the smaller integral change that that's going to be more sensitive to what we're using. And the lung tissue, as you've already gone through this, uh, th both the chapter one uh, upper airway and the lower airway uh, lectures, you have seen how sensitive and especially the simple squamous cell is that that tissue is. So we're going to use the most sensitive unit, which is going to be in centimeters of water pressure. So when we talk mechanical ventilation pressures, we're usually talking in terms of centimeters of water pressure. Uh, we're not usually talking in millimeters of mercury. Now, if we're talking vital signs like blood pressure or cuff pressure or anything like that, usually that's going to be, or even suction pressure for uh, uh, something like a wound vac or something like that, it's going to be in millimeters of mercury. So those are, are usually universal between mechanical ventilation being centimeters of water pressure and then millimeters of mercury being uh, otherwise. All right, so what are the three pressures involved in breathing? So you have your atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure is your first one. When we're looking at atmospheric pressure, there's a couple of different um, 
uh, PB is one of them or PATM is the other one when we're looking at this. So if I write PB or PATM like I've been doing, uh, that's just meaning that's a short way of saying atmospheric pressure. Believe me, there will be a, a, a application for this very soon. So this is the pressure of the air in the environment, the pressure of the air around you right now. So at sea level, if any of you are currently at sea level listening to this, uh, the normal sea level is at 760 millimeters of mercury. Now that can change from place to place, but roughly around 760 millimeters of mercury. And on your board exams, they may not give you, especially if you have to calculate something like the alveolar air equation, uh, the current barometric pressure. What they're asking you is, hey, what's barometric pressure at sea level? And so that's the number that you're supposed to use when you're taking the board exams if they don't provide that to you. Now here in Denver, we're roughly around 630, 640 in that area. Uh, so when we're doing them here, I'll, I will try to give you, if I want you to use a different barometric pressure, I'll, I'll give you that direct pressure. But if I don't give you a direct barometric pressure, assume sea level, right? Because that's what your board exams will be. They're assuming that your board exams, they're assuming that you're practicing at a hospital at sea level. So you have to use that numerical value. So here we have less barometric pressure in Denver then we do at a place at more of a sea level location. That means we, when we go back to what we were talking about before with the alveolar air equation, we have less pressure helping oxygen diffuse into our bloodstream. Isn't that crazy? So it makes it a little bit harder. So our average pressure of oxygen in our bloodstream is actually a little bit lower, right, as far as the pressure of oxygen in our bloodstream, it's a little bit lower than someone at sea level. So it's kind of interesting there. So that may be why so many people, and there's athletes that will train purposefully at high levels, uh, high altitudes, so that way their body creates more red blood cells to compensate to carry more oxygen, and then they'll go back down to sea level to compete. And that helps them carry more oxygen, therefore avoid a lactic acid uh, buildup in their muscles, and they'll be able to compete a lot more strenuously with less fatigue. Isn't that crazy? All right, atmospheric pressure. Uh, we talked about that, 760 uh, sea level, 640 in Denver. Alveolar pressure is the other pressure involved with breathing. So PALV or P big A, right? Uh, that will be the alveolar pressure. And this is how much pressure there is inside the lungs themselves. So notice something. What's the resting value of alveolar pressure, right? It's 760. It is the same as the atmospheric pressure around you. Now remember, in chapter one, I stated that you will breathe in until you reach equilibrium, right? And then when you breathe out, you'll breathe out until you reach equilibrium, right? So the pressure inside your lung and the pressure inside the, or the pressure inside the lung, the pressure on the outside in the atmosphere need to equalize at end inhale. I've reached equilibrium and then at end exhale, they'll reach equilibrium as well, right? They need to reach that equilibrium state ultimately. So if I'm at Denver, what would my resting alveolar pressure be? Well, it'd be 640, right? And then inhale and exhale. If I'm at sea level, my resting alveolar pressure would be 760 and inhale and then 760 and exhale. All right, and then your third pressure involved with breathing is pleural pressure. And this is the vacuumous pressure in the pleural space. So the pleural space that determines the pressure of the thoracic cavity. So the more negative pressure I have in my pleural space, the deeper the breath I can take, right? That's why when you right now try to force yourself to take a really deep breath in, <gasps> what'd you do? You use accessory muscles to pull aggressively the rib cage open, whether it's the diaphragm, right, the uh, external intercostal, so on and so forth, you use those muscles to create more pleural pressure ultimately, right? We're, it, we're making the thoracic cavity increase in volume, therefore creating more pleural pressure and therefore pulling more gas in, right? That's how that whole chain of reaction works. So notice here in assuming sea level, at resting, the pleural pressure is at 755 millimeters of mercury. So if we're at sea level, right? Put in your head that you're somewhere at sea level, like a nice beach in Florida, who knows, right? 
So if you're at sea level 760 and your pleural space and your alveolar pressure is the same, 760, and your pleural space is at 755, what does that tell you about the overall resting pressure in your pleural space? It is less than or greater than atmospheric pressure. Well, it's less than atmospheric pressure, and that's a term called sub atmospheric, right? I have less pressure in my pleural space than I do in my alveoli, as well as less pressure in my pleural space than I do in the atmosphere. That's called sub-atmospheric. And we need that negative vacuum of space, like I said before, to help expand our lungs, to help us ventilate. So what are the three pressures involved with breathing? Right? We just talked about them. Atmospheric, alveolar, so atmospheric, alveolar, and pleural pressure, right? So how does air get into the lungs, remember? Okay, we talked about this before. Here's our lung tissue. So the diaphragm ex uh, contracts and moves down, therefore the volume of the lung tissue increases, so the molecules are further apart, right, all the gas in our lungs are further apart, and that creates negative pressure. So when our diaphragm moves down, we have an increase in our pleural pressure, right, that pleural pressure becomes even more negative, which then pulls our lungs open. When the lungs open and the volume of that container increases, that means we have less pressure in our lungs than we do in the atmosphere, and therefore gas will move in. Right, and we're going to go over that so many times. All right, the movement of air from the atmosphere into our respiratory system follows a pressure gradient. So the gas uh, will go from regions of high pressure to low pressure. So if I had a tube, And over here, I had 10 centimeters of water pressure. And over here, I had 20 centimeters of water pressure. Which way would gas flow in this tube? I have a high pressure over here on the right and a low pressure on the left. Well, as we see here, gas in air will flow from regions of high pressures to low pressure. So in other words, gas will go from a high gradient to low gradient, therefore it will go from right to left in that picture that you're looking at there. So we need this pressure gradient to help move that gas. So when we're looking at this, how we actually exchange gas is we're gonna play with this gradient. If I create more of a gradient, let's say I have a uh, same tube here, right? And I still only have 10 here, but now I create uh, a pressure of 40. So gas will move even faster, right? I'll have even more um, force behind that gas, and that will create, because there's a greater uh, gradient that goes on there. So you can sort of see how pressure changes can be a big thing here. So when we're looking at resting pressures, this is where our atmospheric and alveolar pressure reach equilibrium. So when I inhale, I'm gonna keep inhaling until there's no gradient anymore, until my alveolar pressure equals my atmospheric pressure. Then I will have uh, uh, the stop, I will stop contracting my diaphragm, and then therefore I'll have elastic recoil of my lung tissue, because remember lungs wanna recoil in. So I have an elastic recoil of my lung tissue, which when a volume of a container decreases, right, our lung tissues collapsing, then pressure will increase, then we'll have supra-atmospheric pressure in our alveoli compared to atmosphere and gas will flow out. That's us exhaling. How long do you exhale? Well, how do you know when you're done exhaling? Well, you'll exhale until there's no more gradient. So in this situation here where there's 20 and 10, that we're going to exchange this pressure down here until we reach 10 
and 10 or so on and so forth until we reach equilibrium therefore no gas will flow anymore right there's no pressure gradient so that's what has us sort of stop the breath in as well as stop the breath out so when these pressures are equilibrium they're set at zero centimeters of water pressure so an end inhale all right here's the bullet point you need a pressure gradient to breathe and at end inhale and to end exhale there's no gradient, right? That's when we reach equilibrium. Atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure are equal to each other. There's no gradient. It's zero centimeters of water pressure. There is no difference between the two. That's equilibrium. Okay, so we're still going to get into this a little bit deeper. So if you need to take a break, take a break. If you need to speed this up or slow it down, do so. All right, when we're talking about pressure, some parts of the respiratory system are in contact with the atmosphere, such as our, our nose, our mouth, and we'll just do body surface, right? So our thoracic, our body surface, our atmosphere around us, right? So pressure at the nose and the mouth and our body surface, these are all things that are sort of in contact with the atmosphere. And you're like, why would these matter? Well. Trust me, we'll get into some applications here. Just got to stick with me through the physics first. All right, know that there is an application, but stick with me through this and I'll show it to you. Okay, so at rest, we already talked about this. Alveolar pressure and atmospheric pressure are at equilibrium. There's no air moving in or out. Air pressure, as we know, goes from a high gradient to a low gradient. So when air flows into the lungs, Right when we're inhaling, our atmospheric pressure is greater than our alveolar pressure, right? Because it goes from high to low. So as our atmospheric pressure increases, our alveolar pressure decreases, and that is when gas is moving into the lungs. It looks like this might be something I could quiz you on later. P A T M, and then. P-A-L-V, right? So alveolar pressure and atmospheric pressure. If I said alveolar pressure was greater than atmospheric pressure, which way is gas flowing? Well, I have higher pressure in my alveoli than I do in my atmosphere. So you, knowing that gas goes from high to low, will see that this patient is exhaling because we have higher alveolar pressure than we do in the atmosphere, okay? So I want you to get this concept of pressure changes when someone's breathing, right? When we're inhaling, our atmospheric pressure is greater than alveolar pressure. And then just like the example I drew at the top here, when alveolar pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure, we're exhaling. We're getting gas out until we reach equilibrium. At both stages, end inhale and end exhale, you will reach equilibrium. When alveolar pressure is less than atmospheric pressure, this is called sub-atmospheric, right? That's a term I would expect you to remember, right? So some more basic concepts about pressure. Encasing and protecting the lungs is the chest wall, right? Th this is the, the plural space, right? So encasing and protecting the lungs is the pleural space or the pleural cavity, if you will, pleural cavity, which is part of the chest wall. The chest wall has a natural tendency to expand. And so when we're looking at the pleural, pleural cavity, it's that chest wall, that visceral and parietal pleural. Remember, the parietal pleural is on the outside, and then we'll do purple here. The, the visceral pleural is on the inside. So as the chest wall expands, it moves out, and we're getting more space in between the visceral and the parietal pleura. That more space, remember, we're increasing the volume in that pleural space, and therefore we're increasing the amount of suction that's in that pleural space, and therefore it'll pull the lung tissue out with it. I know this is a very hands-on thing, um, but do the best you can here to look at this. So that pleural cavity is part of the chest wall and it creates that suction that helps us breathe. 
So the lungs have a natural tendency to collapse or recoil in because remember, there's that elastic part, there's elastins, right? There's elastic parts that are around the respiratory zone and they surround that great blood structure, they surround the alveoli. And so the lung tissue, because when we're talking about the respiratory zone here, when we're looking at it, there's no structure to keep it open, right? There's no cartilage in the respiratory zone and it will have a natural tendency because it has elasticity to be at a closed or collapsed state, right? Think about a rubber band, right? If you were to look at a rubber band right now, is it at a fully expanded, stretched out state in its natural tendency or is it in its natural tendency in a collapsed small state, right? In its natural tendency, it'll be in a collapsed small state. Well, your lungs are exactly, this, or the respiratory zone of the lungs are exactly the same way. They're gonna be collapsed in during a resting state. And so our lungs are introverted. They wanna collapse in. Our, our rib cage, our thoracic cavity, it wants to be expanded. And so we have this push-pull odd couple relationship that works out to our benefit. Between the chest wall and the lungs, there's a fluid filled space called the, we already talked about it, the pleural cavity. It's completely sealed surrounding each lung, right? This is very important for breathing. Pleural pressure, which is the PPL here, is always less than barometric pressure. Therefore, the term subatmospheric or negative pressure, I like to use the term vacuum, a lot of people think of that as well, but this is subatmospheric or a negative pressure space. So the lungs contain alveoli, we already talked about those, uh, that are elastic organs like a balloon or rubber band. The lungs and the alveoli expand when air enters, <gasps> right? They have that ability to stretch like a balloon, but they always want to, <sighs> recoil and collapse inwardly, right? There's nothing keeping them expanded, especially if there's something that keeps them going back in. So the natural tendency of our lung tissue is to collapse, right? That's the elastic recoil. Elasticity is the natural tendency to collapse. I will repeat that again. Elasticity is the natural tendency to collapse. So when we're looking at the respiratory system, the inward collapse creates pressure moving inwardly, right? Look at that picture on your right. You see that picture down there? So the lungs naturally want to go in. That's why you see all those arrows pointing right in. So the lungs have a natural tendency to collapse, and so they're constantly going to be introverted. They just want to stay inside. They want to stay close to each other. The rib cage naturally wants to be out, open, and in its expanded state here. So both of these are pulling away from each other. So as both of these are pulling away from each other, it creates suction, right? What's in the middle there is a hollow cavity. It's that pleural space that has fluid in it for movement of the visceral and parietal pleura, but it, it creates that suction in that fluid-filled space because we have that negative pressure, we have the, the tendency between the lungs to collapse in and the rib cage to go out, we're creating that negative pressure in the pleural space. So when we're talking about um, the, the, this natural status of the pleural space being negative, how do they become negative? Well, the pleural space is negative because our lungs want to collapse in and our rib cage wants to expand out. And because of this tug of war, it creates that vacuumous space. It creates that negative pressure in the middle. Uh, it's not a neutral zone, it's a negative pressure because they're both pulling at each other. Right? So this is what they might be talking about, how the static characteristics of the lungs is looking at elastic recoil and how much that works. So as we just stated, your chest wall has a natural tendency to expand and the lungs have a natural tendency to recoil inwards, right? It's that push-pull, that tug-of-war relationship. Because of your pleura that sort of separates the tool, they'll keep pulling apart at each other, and that's what creates that negative or that vacuum inside the pleural cavity, right? So that negative pleural cavity pressure, if it builds up high enough, 
if we get enough of that negative pressure, then we're going to sort of tell the lungs, you're coming with us. The, the chest wall will win that tug of war and will pull the lungs open until we reach alveolar equilibrium with the atmospheric equilibrium, right? That's when they'll reach that equilibrium and then hopefully the diaphragm will can stop contracting and then we'll be able to exhale and then we'll reach equilibrium at the end of exhalation, right? That's the whole thing. So this is just sort of summarizing what we've been talking about there. So there are two forces because of this. Uh, we have resting volume. And one of the things that you'll hear a lot in the respiratory program here is functional residual capacity or FRC for short. And that's what you see there on that second bullet point. FRC, functional residual capacity. That means when you exhale right now, right, you're quietly exhaling, hopefully, unless you're running on a treadmill or something and uh, you're quietly exhaling and at the end of your exhale do you think you've emptied your lungs completely or as you're breathing right now do you think you can blow out further than what you would normally do well odds are unless you have a severe restrictive disorder you probably can blow out further than what you normally do after your quiet exhalation so the gas left in your lungs after the end of a quiet exhalation that's what we call FRC or how much is left over, right? It's like withdrawing cash from a savings account. How much is left over after all that happens, right? How much is left over would be your FRC. How much, what's my balance in the savings account? That's the FRC. So this is how much re remains in the lungs when we have that quiet exhalation. So how much is left over? Right, how much can we tap into if we really need to force out even more of a breath? So the FRC actually helps maintain some of the lungs staying open when we exhale quietly. It helps keep some of the lungs open instead of collapsing completely from being a grape to a, a raisin, right? That's the mental image like you've seen on that previous picture. Instead of going from a grape to a raisin we'll go from a large grape as fully expanded deep breath in state to just a little bit of a smaller grape it's that frc that sort of keeps some of the gas in the lung tissue therefore we're not going to have as much need for pressure change with each breath so frc actually makes it easier for you to breathe isn't that crazy all right, so this slide, uh, and then I think chapter three of your book goes over this in a detail as well. And you'll see this in your head for a long time here on out. Uh, these are the different volumes of gas in your lungs, as well as the different capacities of gas in your lungs. Okay, what in the world is this picture? It looks like something uh, from a pyramid. What's going on there? So let's break this down one by one, right? Let's start with tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of gas that you move quietly in and out of your lungs. So you sitting there just relaxing, breathing, just quiet breathing. You're using 10% of your total lung capacity, which if you look over here, it says TLC on the picture. TLC, this is not the network. It is looking at how much capacity or how much total gas your lung can hold, right? Total lung capacity. At a resting state, a tidal volume, just quiet, normal breathing state, you're only using about 10% of that. So over here, you're seeing the tidal volume, just normal, quiet breathing. See this red line, right? That's normal, quiet breathing that you're looking at there. That's your tidal volume. That's what you're doing right now. And so tidal volume is just normal, quiet breathing, and you'll see the definitions. I do not have room to write them in by hand here uh, in chapter um, uh, three, I believe, in your book. Uh, so tidal volume, normal, quiet breathing, and then IRV or inspiratory reserve volume. So you're breathing quietly. If you need to take a really deep breath in, <gasps> Right, like let's say you're about to blow out a candle, okay? So are you just gonna use the normal quiet breath to blow out the candle? <sighs> right, no, you're gonna take a deep breath in. <gasps> and it's that deep breath in, that's the inspiratory reserve volume, was what you're looking at here. So here you see a patient breathing 
right? Normal, quiet breathing, and then they take the deep breath in, <gasps> all the way up until as much as their lung can hold, right? That's the IRV. It's how much you have left in you to take a big deep breath in. So your IRV or your inspiratory reserve volume, just if you're curious, I won't make you memorize the percentages here, uh, is about 40%. 40% of your total lung capacity. So that's just a little bit of extra you can take in if you really <gasps> need to get that extra breath in to create compression for a cough or something like that. So ERV is the next one. ERST, ERV stands for expiratory reserve volume, and that's down here. So this is a little bit of what we were talking about before. From a quiet tidal volume, if you were to exhale, and that's what you see here in the picture. If I were to exhale, and I exhale as far as I possibly can, I mean, I really try to get every squeeze, every last ounce of breath out of me, I'm tapping into my expiratory reserve volume. So it's how much I have left over at the end of a tidal volume breath, right? How much you have left over at the end of a tidal volume breath. This is the amount that you can actually exhale past a tidal volume breath. Okay, so those are my four volumes. So you have four volumes and you have four capacities. Let me switch to yellow. Four volumes and four capacities. So when we're looking at capacity, the definition of a capacity is two or more volumes. All right, two or more volumes together. What does that mean? So let's start here. Let's start at FRC, okay? When we're looking at FRC on the graph, it contains two or more volumes. So what volumes does it contain? It contains this one down here called the residual volume, and we'll go over that one here in a second, as well as the expiratory reserve volume. So this one contains ERV, an RV, right? So the functional residual capacity has two or more volumes. So capacity means it's a bundled deal, right? It's a fancy word of saying we bundled some of the volumes together. It'll make it easier. So at the end of a quiet exhalation, as you see in the graph on the left, the patient just quietly breathing in, breathing out. Whatever is left over at the end of a quiet exhalation, this whole thing is FRC, and that helps keep the lungs open. So when we're looking at FRC, it includes the ERV and then the residual volume. Well, if the RV is the residual volume, this is the amount of gas that no matter how much you force yourself to breathe out, you will not be able to do it. It was established at birth, and you will probably never get um, uh, get rid of it unless for some reason your rib cage were to be destroyed in some sort of violent situation, right? As long as your rib cage is even intact post mortem, you will still have some residual volume, right? As long as your rib cage is intact, right, then you have residual volume. Isn't that crazy? So residual volume is the amount of gas that you cannot exhale. It is residual. It is left over, ultimately. So it's pretty hard to get rid of. So when we look at FRC, we have gas that's trapped as far as residual volume and then gas we can tap into. So let's say someone has um, emphysema. Here, you're asking for a practical application. Here you go. Someone has emphysema and one of the classic things that happens with emphysema is the lungs hyper expand. They get really stretched out, and that creates holes, and it bursts capillaries that surround the alveoli. And so ultimately what happens is we lose elasticity of the respiratory zone. If we lose the elastic recoil of the lungs, that means more gas will be stuck in our lungs, right? So if we're doing a pulmonary function test, and someone has severe emphysema, what would happen to the FRC, which is how much is left over in their lungs? Because the lungs aren't recoiling as well, their FRCs are actually going to be increased. So all this will come together, like I said, if you don't have it all together right now, that's okay. 
but we're sort of starting you down the path of what is tidal volume? What's the definition of tidal volume? Uh, if I asked you how much, what's the name for the volume of gas in your lungs that you can inhale past the tidal volume, you should say, well, that's your inspiratory reserve volume. Or what's the name of the uh, amount of gas that you can exhale quietly past a tidal volume. Well, you'd be like, that's your expiratory reserve volume. What's the name of the gas or volume in your lungs that you cannot get rid of no matter what, and it stays there uh, forever? You'd be like, oh, that's your residual volume. Okay, so we've already talked about functional residual capacity down here. What's the next one up? Let's talk about vital capacity and this is going to be a big one when we do pulmonary function testing on someone if you go to a health fair and you see them doing lung function testing or maybe you yourself have done this where they have you take a deep breath in and then blow into a machine as hard and as much as they possibly can that's what they're doing they're actually usually looking at the vital capacity so this is the amount of gas you can forcefully inhale and forcefully exhale and that's what we're looking at here on the graph you sort of see it that's how much you can inhale all the way up, and that's as much as you can exhale all the way down to residual volume. That's called your vital capacity. So if someone had really stiff lungs, right, let's say there's scar tissue that built up in, in the respiratory zone, and that happens with pulmonary fibrosis, and so the, the tissue does not want to expand, what would happen with their vital capacity? Would it be big, where they can contain a lot of stuff because their lungs are very stretchy, or would it be very small because their lungs are very stiff, right? So their vital capacities will be small. So if someone has a restrictive disorder, like pulmonary fibrosis, then their lung capacities will be small. Their functional residual capacity will be decreased. Their vital capacity will be decreased. Their total lung capacity, which is the next one, would be decreased as well. So if someone has a restrictive disorder, when we do a pulmonary function test, we'll look at both their volumes and their flow rates. All right. So we'll look at all these and their flow rates. If their volumes are low, we know that's something that's restricting the pulmonary tissue from expanding. Now, when we do pulmonary function test on something like asthma, it's not the volume of the lungs, really. It's more of how fast gas can go out of the lungs. So because the volume um, is usually normal to sometimes increased, depending on what's going on, it's the speed of the gas that goes down, right? So if you have a four-lane highway, and two of the four lanes of the highway get shut down, what's going to happen to the speed of the traffic past that that accident or whatever it is that caused that, that restriction in the lanes? It's going to be very slow. So if I have someone that has a low flow rate or their gas flowing out of their lungs is coming out slowly, very slowly, then that tells me that there's something obstructing, something blocking the flow of gas coming out. So when we look at things like asthma, I'm going to see how fast the gas is that they're blowing out. Uh, it's not necessarily about the volumes and capacities like we see on the screen here, but I want to see how fast that gas is coming out. And based upon the speed of that gas, I can see how severe their obstruction is or how severe their asthma might be. Isn't that crazy? Um, so total lung capacity, I hopefully I talked about it. The total lung capacity is the maximum amount of gas that your lungs can contain, right? It's the maximum amount of gas that your lungs can contain from that last slide there. And so we're hoping that uh, your total lung capacity uh, over time uh, should not change too much as as a grown adult. It should not change too much. But your vital capacity, depending on your elasticity, things like that um, can all change depending too on your body habitus as well. All right, the most important muscle for breathing, <laughs> and we've already talked about this one quite a bit, is the diaphragm, right? The most important muscle for breathing is the diaphragm. It moves down to enlarge the thoracic cavity, therefore, increasing volume and according to Boyle's law it will decrease pressure right so that's the whole thing there so the diaphragm is important here for you to breathe uh, it does the opposite during exhalation the during exhalation your volume 
decreases and therefore your pressure will increase, right? That's how it works. That's the normal exchange. So there are accessory muscles like your external intercostals and sternocleidomastoids and all those other ones. But these muscles are attached to the ribs, the clavicles, and they move the ribs or the chest wall out. But they're not considered the primary muscle uh, as far as disjardins or the, the pulmonary AMP book is concerned. So all the muscles of breathing usually increase the volume of the rib cage, therefore generating more or a greater subatmospheric pressure. The greater the subatmospheric pressure in the pleural space, the greater the expansion of the alveoli, which means air will move in during breathing, right? We've already gone over this. So I'll try to frame it different ways as we go through so that way hopefully one of them goes in. So as we're breathing, we, we have this sort of cycle that we use. We inhale, we reach equilibrium, rest, and then exhale, and then we reach equilibrium, rest, and then hopefully repeat the whole thing for about 80 to 100 years, something like that. During each cycle, um, the volume of gas that moves in and out of the respiratory tract is what we're looking at as ventilation, right? How much volume? And that volume can be measured uh, when we do pulmonary function testing to sort of see if someone has a restrictive issue like fibrosis, or we can see if someone has an obstructive issue like asthma, right? We can sort of look at those things in more detail. So the volume that we're using during quiet cycle breathing is measured and it, we can look at a PFT machine and that's what we call a tidal volume, right? Just like the tidaling of waves on an ocean, right? It's that tidal volume. How much is breathing, uh, is the patient breathing? So sometimes we need more tidal volume, like to get a deeper breath, <gasps> like you're going to blow out candles, right? So you can get more volume in. So uh, if I have tidal volume and I add my inspiratory reserve volume, <gasps> Both of those together are what's going to be called, and it was not on the previous slide, so hopefully you're paying attention, inspiratory capacity, or IC. So both of these together is called inspiratory capacity, right? So inspiratory reserve volume in IRV is my inspiratory capacity. How much can my lungs contain if I take a big breath? on top of a tidal volume breath. So just inspiratory capacity is how much I can contain uh, with both tidal volume and IRV together. So there's a reason why it was left out. And there it is, so I could talk about it here. So which way does the diaphragm move when we're breathing? So when we're inhaling, so this is something you need to make sure you got down. When we're inhaling, the diaphragm contracts just like any other muscle. When it contracts, it gets shorter. So when the diaphragm contracts, the diaphragm moves down, right? It moves down. When we're exhaling, if it moves down when we're inhaling, what does it do when we exhale? Well, it moves up, right? It's gonna be relaxed, move up. Uh, what is the elastic recoil of the lungs? Well, that is the ability for it to snap back into place, to go from a bigger uh, rubber band to a smaller rubber band, right? That's that elastic recoil going from a high, big rubber band to a small rubber band. It's that snap back. What's the tendency for chest wall movement? So you should be thinking about these before I answer them. The, the tendency for the rib cage or the thoracic cage is for it to expand or collapse. Well, the tendency for the chest wall movement is to be out. It's to expand. It's to move out. So what has to happen for air to enter and leave the respiratory system? And how are pressure and volume related? Well, let's look at what has to happen for air to enter and leave the respiratory system. So the diaphragm in this, I would take special note of this slide. Hint. <laughs> so the diaphragm to breathe in has to go down right? Step one, right? The lungs, right, will then open up and get bigger. So I have a bigger container, right? That's this first one here, 
right? Then because my container is bigger, I will have less atmospheric pressure. So I'm just going to do low pressure or, or alveolar pressure, sorry. Low alveolar pressure compared to the environment, which means I have higher barometric pressure. So gas will move in, so I'm inhaling. Does that make sense? So diaphragm is going to move down. That's my first step. The lungs will expand. Second step. By doing that, according to Boyle's law, my alveolar pressure decreases, which then creates a gradient because now I have low alveolar pressure compared to high barometric pressure. So gas will flow in. Okay. Then the reverse is also true. As the as I start to exhale, right, the first thing is going to be my diaphragm will move up. My volume of container will get smaller. Tiny lungs. So I'm just drawing a small bubble as the as we're going to the elastic recoil. Then my alveolar pressure, because this container got real small, my alveolar pressure actually increases. And therefore, I will high, have high alveolar pressure compared to my atmospheric pressure. And therefore, I will exhale. So breathing in, diaphragm moves down, lungs expand, alveolar pressure decreases compared to atmospheric pressure, and therefore we'll inhale. Then when we exhale, our diaphragm will move up. Our volume of our lungs will decrease. Therefore, our alveolar pressure will be higher than atmospheric pressure and we'll exhale all the way out. Hopefully putting it this way uh, might help you guys sort of visualize this a little bit better. I'm a very visual person and this is such a hard concept not to do hands-on. Uh, I, I, I will do what I can to sort of get this across. I'll see what I can find for you guys. So how are pressure and volume related, right? That last bullet point is sort of wrote over there. Remember, whose law is this? This is Boyle's law, right? Pressure and volume vary inversely as long as mass and temperature are constant. So let's look at that. All right, this is Boyle's law. Uh, had a good hair day that day, apparently. But uh, this is a, a gas law that's important to pressure and volume. And this is the exchange of your lungs, right? This is what we're looking at here with your lungs. So the temperature is going to be constant. It's going to be at body temperature, pressure saturated, BTPS. Now remember, when you calculate this law, you have to use Kelvin. But remember, temperature is constant here. So we don't have to put that factor in there. I hear some excitement. Right. <laughs> uh, so when we're looking at this, we're just looking at pressure and volume being inverse. If one goes up, the other one's going down. If one goes down, the other one goes up. Right? They're they're an odd couple. They they're opposites. They, if one's doing one, the other one's doing the opposite. Right? And so that's what we're looking at here. Now, for us that love equations, here you go. That's the Boyle's law written out. But I want you to get the concept down. It's the concept or how we're going to use it uh, that is going to become very important as we get to both regular breathing and helping our patients, patients that don't have mechanical ventilation as well as mechanical ventilation as well. So Boyle's Law, this is what we're showing here. In A, if you look at the top, a decrease in volume, uh, the pressure will increase right here we have a box you see how close these molecules are together right you see all these little molecules just bouncing off and creating pressure right so the smaller the container the higher pressure right even with your blood your vascular system if i have a big giant blood vessel and i have a little tiny vasoconstricted blood vessel which one's going to have more pressure which one's going to have the higher pressure well it's going to be the smaller one because all the red blood cells are being squished together that would be more separated out over in the giant blood vessel so when we want to increase someone's blood pressure one of the things we can do is actually give them something to narrow their blood vessels it's called a presser right uh, so the same thing, we're sort of looking at Boyle's Law, even though we're not looking at gas there, we're just looking at pressure in the container. But you can see how the molecules just being closer proximity to each other creates that pressure. And as that container increases in size, which is what you see in letter B down here, 
that pressure is going to fall because look how far apart these molecules now are, right? Or red blood cells or whatever it is that you're that we're going to be dealing with here. So therefore, it makes sense that the bigger the container, the less pressure there is. The smaller the container, the higher pressure that that's just the science of it. So which part of breathing is active, inhaling or exhaling? Let's see, hopefully you said inhaling, right? Inhaling is the active process. Quiet exhalation is usually passive. Most mechanical ventilators, save one that I know of, most mechanical ventilators only do breath in. Almost every ventilator out there on the market will just let the patient exhale passively, right? It doesn't suck the breath back out of them, right? It lets it do it naturally. So does inhalation require, does it require muscles of respiration? Does inhalation require muscles of respiration? Absolutely, right? What's the primary muscle respiration? Hope you said the diaphragm, right? Boyle's law, what's constant and what is in relationship to each other? So temperature and mass are constant, therefore, pressure and volume what's their relationship they're directly related or inversely related well if they're inversely related if pressure increases that means volume decreases right so whatever one does the other one's going to go ahead and do the opposite it's like a dysfunctional relationship <laughs> That works for breathing anyway. Uh, <laughs> how does alveolar pressure become subatmospheric? Oh heavens, hopefully you remember. So first step is our diaphragm will move down, which means our lung tissue will expand, right? And that's when they become subatmospheric. So that means that we have a decrease in alveolar pressure compared to atmospheric pressure and then gas will move in so how this happens active passive diaphragm chest wall boils atmospheric alveolar pressure Whew. right so this is where we just need to go over this again and again that's what i recommend inhaling the diaphragm moves down the volume of tissues expands so the volume of the container increases therefore alveolar pressure decreases compared to atmospheric pressure and then we'll inhale okay as you exhale the diaphragm will move up the container of your lungs gets smaller thanks elastic recoil and because the container got smaller alveolar pressure increased which then in relation to atmospheric pressure at the time will be higher. So atmospheric pressure is decreased. So nothing happens with the atmosphere. We just have higher alveolar pressure, that's all. And then that means that gas will flow out. So we are exhaling here, right? Just so we just keep going over that, write it down. Don't get a tattoo of it, but write it down. <laughs> Hopefully remember it very soon. It sounds like I will ask you about this process a lot if I'm going over it this much. All right, so inhalation is an active process. The diaphragm moves down, the chest wall moves up and out, increases the volume of the thoracic cage and the alveoli. The increase in volume causes a lower pressure, right? That subatmospheric pressure in the alveoli compared to atmospheric pressure, and will create a driving pressure to move air into our lungs for inhalation exhalation we've already gone over this this is passive at the end of inspiration we'll reach equilibrium and the diaphragm will move back up the chest wall moves down and in the the volume of the lungs will get smaller because the lungs are getting smaller right the container alveolar pressure increases as because alveolar pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure then we will exhale, right? Gas will be forced through that pressure gradient or that driving pressure out, right? Until we get to that resting equilibrium. So inhalation, exhalation, like I said, the physics of breathing, this is a big part of this. Inhalation begins with the contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostals. The diaphragm will move, so we're seeing it go from here to here. 
the diaphragm will move down, right? You see the volume of the container increasing, right? The rib cage, all that stuff that pulls the lungs open, right? And that will allow for that negative alveolar pressure to take place. During inhalation, your gas will go in and cause the pressure to be at equilibrium with the atmosphere. If there's no, uh, there's no driving pressure, there's no pressure gradient once we reach equilibrium, the gas flow will stop and therefore the pressure sensors in our lungs called the baroreceptors are going to see that we've reached that and then trigger our brain to stop contracting our diaphragm and therefore end inhalation. Pretty cool. So let me ask you this. We're going through this. And let me ask you, if you're at the top of Mount Everest, there's not a lot of pressure up there, okay? The FiO2 is still room air, right? You're still at 21% oxygen uh, or 0.21 FiO2 uh, when, you're, when you're at the top of Mount Everest and then when you're in Colorado. You have the same amount or concentration of oxygen when we're looking at things like this. So when we're talking about these driving pressures, let's say the top of Mount Everest. So here we'll just say you're at 640 millimeters of mercury and the top amount of Everest we'll just say it's 200 millimeters of mercury okay just as an example so if you're looking to reach equilibrium will it make it easier or harder as you climb an altitude to get that deep breath in well it'll make it harder to get that deep breath in because you have less of a pressure or driving pressure gradient right so it's not the the lack of oxygen in the atmosphere that might make it harder to breathe at the top of Mount Everest it's not the lack of oxygen it's actually the lack of atmospheric pressure or barometric pressure as you go up there isn't that crazy so you actually breathe very shallow up there which means you're gonna have to compensate by breathing faster and it's gonna be a lot harder to get more oxygen into your bloodstream right and that's why those people there are people that ha uh, most people that do that climb for Everest have to wear oxygen it's not because there's less oxygen up there it's because it's harder to get oxygen into the bloodstream because there's less barometric pressure and hey if you go back to the alveolar air equation minus CO2 20 um, when we go to the alveolar equation, remember, we're, it's not the FiO2 that's changing as we're climbing, right? It's not the CO2 part that's really changing as we're climbing unless we're doing a wind sprint. It's the barometric pressure is decreasing, therefore less pressure to diffuse and making it actually harder to breathe. So during exhalation, eventually the gas that's moved out of the alveoli will decrease enough to go to equilibrium right since there's no driving pressure gas flow will cease as we exhale and this will be the end exhalation so this is the diaphragm moving up or relaxing becoming elongated therefore the thoracic cage and the lung tissue will move in on itself and get smaller which will increase alveolar pressure and alveolar pressure will then be greater than atmospheric pressure and then gas will be forced out uh, this is a different picture from your book it sort of goes over the same way and your version may not have the exact same one um, but this is saying the same thing just with different pictures and it's showing the rib cage and then the muscles that are contracting as well so it's showing in uh, the insp inspiratory one on the top here your inspiratory muscles contract and you see how much bigger the rib cage gets right and that will allow for that volume to increase <sighs> and gas to flow in ultimately. When we're looking at this, the intrapulmonary pressure doesn't change too much. We're only looking at about one millimeter of mercury of change. Now that's using millimeter of mercury, not centimeters of water pressure. So it'd be a little bit more in centimeters of water pressure. Um, but when we're looking at 
the 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 change of pressure it's not very great until we reach equilibrium well same thing when we look at exhalation look at number four in exhalation you go to plus one in millimeters of mercury now of course that would be more in centimeters of water pressure but we're looking at that pressure change not being too significant that's why you breathing quietly right now don't have what we call worker breathing where you're not using a lot of accessory muscles now if you are using accessory muscles that's a sign you're trying to create even more pressure to overcome something let's say the pleural cavity is filled with a bunch of uh with a big infection and called uh empyema right and a bunch of like pus and bad stuff are, are just filling up in that pleural space well if there's a bunch of fluid building up in the pleural space, you can't generate a lot of negative pressure because if the fluid builds up in the space, that means the volume of that space, as far as gas pressure goes, the gas pressure would de uh, the volume would decrease, and therefore pressure would become more positive and not as negative. So you'd have to work even harder to pull that breath in. If I were to give someone like a, a massive pleural fusion or and empyema, it's going to make it harder to breathe, harder to generate that negative pleural pressure. Uh, this is also a different one from your book. Like I said, I love pictures. So if these resonate with you, great. If they don't, if they confuse you and you get it just academically, uh, great. Go with it, okay? <laughs> so this is just another way of saying the same thing we've just been talking about, right? I create negative pleural pressure, which expands the alveolar tissue and gas will flow in, right? Till I reach equilibrium. And then once I reach equilibrium, uh, I will tell my diaphragm to stop contracting. So my diaphragm will move up. You see it down at the bottom part. Therefore, I'm going to allow the elasticity of my lungs to take over and create positive alveolar pressure. I have more alveolar pressure compared to atmospheric pressure and therefore gas will flow out until I reach no gas flow, until I reach equilibrium. Different ways of looking at it, please do one of the ways, whichever ways work. I'm trying to give you a diversity here and hopefully that helps because we do not have hands on right now. All right, so let's look at pressure differences across the lungs. So we'll look at driving pressure, trans airway pressure, trans pulmonary pressure, trans thoracic pressure. There's also uh, another pressure that we won't talk about here that is in your book, um, uh, transmural pressure. And that's something that we can talk about at a later date, but uh, I don't think it's uh, adequate time to bring that in yet. So as we're doing some reviews, atmospheric pressure, normal should be 760. Right? It's also known as pressure at the airway opening, PAO, pressure at the mouth, and pressure at the body surface. You notice that was the fill in the blanks earlier. Interesting. Uh, pressure at the airway opening, pressure at the mouth, pressure at the body surface. And then alveolar pressure is PALV, so pretty straightforward there. And then pleural pressure is PPL, pleural pressure. And so these are the definitions at normal. Atmospheric pressure should be 760 if you're at sea level. Um, I tried to write these out for the exam, so I'm usually not going to do PPL, PALV, so on and so forth. I'll try to write it out so that way you, you, you'll you still hopefully have some idea of what it's asking. So with alveolar pressure, this is the pressure exerted by gas in the alveoli. It will increase and decrease, right, depending on the respiratory cycle, whether they're inhaling or exhaling. But it will always, notice this is in bold, which means it's super important for you to remember it will always equalize with atmospheric pressure. It will always equalize with atmospheric pressure. So we always reach equilibrium between the alveoli and the atmosphere. So if I go um, to uh, the Dead Sea, right? If I go below sea level, uh, uh, then I will have even more barometric pressure. It's like being in a hyperbaric chamber, right? I have high pressure and it'll be easier to get oxygen into my bloodstream. If I go to the top of Mount Everest, I will have low pressure and therefore it won't take much to reach equilibrium and I'll breathe very shallow and have a harder time getting oxygen into my bloodstream. Hopefully that pressure change, uh, even talking about it with barometric pressure and alveolar pressure, being at equilibrium sort of makes sense why it'd be harder to breathe at the top of Mount Everest than at the Dead Sea, right? makes it a lot harder. So intrapleural pressure should always be lower than both atmospheric and intrapulmonary pressure, right? We already, we, we talked about that, having that vacuumous 
uh, space in there. Now there is an exception to this and I will not test you on the exception. So the only exception here and you can pause and forward it and you know fast forward through that there is the forced exhalation. If I forcefully exhale <laughs> until I'm all the way out until I get all the stuff out of my lungs until I reach my residual volume if I force all the way out <sighs> if I squeeze my thoracic cage small enough if I squeeze my lungs small enough, then I might be able to reach equilibrium between pleural pressure, alveolar pressure, and atmospheric pressure. Isn't that crazy? So there is an exception, and it makes sense, right? If I absolutely empty my lungs as much as possible, then I can reach equilibrium. <laughs> or have you ever heard of the wind being knocked out of someone? There you go. <laughs> and it's hard for them to breathe in that next breath because pleural pressure is now even with alveolar pressure, which is even with atmospheric pressure, so it feels like they can't breathe in. <laughs> right, there you go. All right, driving pressure, we've already talked about this. This is that pressure gradient between two points in a two-bore vessel. This sounds like a definition, and I love to test definitions. So definition, um, important. Uh, gas between, uh, pressure difference between two points in a two-bore vessel. It always goes from high gradient to low gradient is what you're seeing here. So over here we have 20, over here we have five. So the driving pressure, which is just subtracting the two is 15 millimeters of mercury well let's say we make this um 40 right we make this 40 millimeters of mercury and this is still five millimeters of mercury let me ask you a concept question what happened to our driving pressure do we have more driving pressure or less driving pressure right we have a lot more driving pressure we have a lot more force between the two, right? There's more gradient between the two. So instead of 20 over five, which is 15, now we have 40 over five, which is 35, right? Big, big difference, right? Uh, that's gonna create a lot more force and a lot more flow, ultimately. That's why if we increase pressure on a machine to give the patient more pressure, that will increase the driving pressure, therefore increase the amount of gas getting into their lungs. All right, trans airway pressure um, and trans respiratory pressure are synonyms, okay? You're probably tired of synonyms by now, and I don't blame you, honestly don't. I didn't come up with all these synonyms, but nevertheless, we're here. All right, so PRS and PTA, so this is trans airway, trans respiratory pressure, same thing. The difference between the mouth and the alveoli, so the pressure of the mouth, and the alveoli, so this is the equation. So trans airway pressure equals how much pressure there is at your mouth compared to how much pressure there is at your lung. So this is looking at driving pressure. So you're like, where did the driving pressure slide be inserted into this whole thing? Well, that's why it's there. The bigger the gradient between the mouth pressure and the alveolar pressure, the more force there is for gas to move in or out of your lungs. Trans airway pressure. Oh, what's happening here? So if I have a mouth pressure of 760, which would be barometric pressure, and I have an alveolar pressure at 755, what's going on? Which one? What? Okay, what's our driving pressure? Hopefully you did the math there, right? Our driving pressure is 5 millimeters of mercury will gas move into or out of our lungs in this situation well we have mouth pressure which one's higher mouth pressure or alveolar pressure well mouth pressure is higher and we know that with the pressure gradient it always goes from high to low so this means that my mouth pressure and alveolar my mouth pressure is higher than alveolar pressure, so that means I'm going to drive gas into my lungs, towards my alveoli, right? Does that make sense? It's that driving pressure. So I have a higher pressure at the mouth, so 760 compared to 755, right? It's that driving pressure will actually force gas into your lungs. All right, so trans airway pressure or trans respiratory pressure. Now I have a mouth pressure of 760. 
So it sounds like we haven't changed altitude here. And then alveolar pressure at 765. All right, well, first, before we get to solving this, what what's our trans airway pressure? What's our driving pressure here? Well, it's the same. We still have five millimeters of mercury here. Will gas move into or out of the lungs? Well, we know it has to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. So which one of these is higher, 760 or 765? Well, 765 is higher. So our alveolar pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure. So our gas will flow from alveoli to the atmosphere. Therefore, we will be exhaling, right? We're exhaling the lungs. We're getting rid of that gas. Hopefully, this is starting to come together a little bit with the physics of breathing. All right, so that was trans airway pressure. Now we'll look at trans pulmonary pressure. Now, trans pulmonary pressure is different. We're looking at just what's going on in the lungs, just what's going on in the lungs. So we have our alveolar pressure and our pleural pressure, okay? So it's the relationship between your pleural space or your pleural cavity and the alveoli itself. What's going on between that dynamic relationship? The pleural space and the alveoli is pulmonary pressure. Pleural space and alveoli is your transpulmonary pressure, okay? So this is that normal relationship. Here is the equation if you love math. There you go, alveolar pressure minus pleural pressure equals transpulmonary pressure. So this should, should always be positive. It can fluctuate, um, but it should always be less than alveolar pressure because remember our normal was five less or three to five less than our alveolar pressure. So we try to keep that negative space in there. Now, is it possible if you get the wind knocked out of you, if you forcefully exhale all the way that you could create equilibrium? Yeah. So most of the time, though, however, it will be positive, right? Transthoracic space. Oh, heavens. Okay. So trans airway and trans respiratory pressure are the difference between the atmosphere and mouth and the alveoli. Transpulmonary pressure was the difference between alveoli and pleural space. Transthoracic pressure, however, is the difference between alveolar pressure and the body surface pressure. <sighs> Why? Why is this not just lumped in with trans airway pressure? Why, Why is it not just another synonym for that? Well, the body surface may be different at pressure at the mouth. Let's say someone uh, uh, that, uh, that's on positive pressure ventilation, the pressure at their mouth is going to be being pushed in with a machine and therefore does not equal their body surface pressure. Okay, so there are cases where they are not equal and therefore this is going to have its own category as transthoracic pressure. So the body surface pressure under normal circumstances is the same as mouth pressure, which is the same as atmospheric pressure. So under normal negative pressure breathing, under you right now, unless somehow you're on positive pressure ventilation and listening to this, which if you are, kudos to you, um, but you're going to have those all be equal so it's going to be very similar to trans airway and trans um, trans uh, respiratory pressure, uh, not transpulmonary, but it's going to be equal to those as long as you're not on positive pressure ventilation. Uh, so uh, trans thoracic pressure is the same as PTA in most cases. It's just another way of looking at the differences across the lungs. So uh, let's say we had uh, some sort of suction device and we put it around the chest wall itself. Well, what happens to transthoracic pressure compared to mouth pressure? Well, transthoracic pressure will change if I put some sort of vacuum over your rib cage. If I put a vacuum over your rib cage and pull it out, then that's actually going to be adjusting transthoracic pressure, not pressure at the mouth. So it'll be specific to transthoracic pressure and not the same, right, as trans airway pressure. So there are there are separate categories. However, uh, in economy of studying, understand they're they're in generally for most cases the same thing. But there are minute differences in there, and it's important to know that. 
those differences do exist. So at rest, your diaphragm only moves about one and a half centimeters. So pretty small, not too much there, right? Just quiet tidal volume breathing, only 10% of your lungs. So yeah, you're using for quiet breathing. So you don't need to move it that far. And so your normal pleural pressure changes, very, very small when we're looking at this. During a deep breath though, if you're really trying to create a lot of negative pressure to take a deep breath in, six to 10 centimeters, your diaphragm can move per six to 10 centimeters. That's pretty decent length of travel there when we're looking at the diaphragmatic movement overall. Um, these are numbers I would expect you to remember when you're looking at this. Uh, that normal mo quiet movements, one and a half centimeters. Uh, and then your pleural pressure only changes about three to six centimeters of water. And then deep breath, six to 10 centimeters for diaphragmatic movement. Big difference, right? So when we're looking at uh, pressure changes during uh, deep inhalations, we can drop alveolar pressures pretty far, 50 centimeters of water. That's a lot of pressure gradient that we're dropping there. Or even in a forced exhalation, we can increase alveolar pressures. 70 to 100 centimeters of water above the atmospheric pressure. Isn't that crazy? So we can really have a wide variation here, but normally you only need one and a half centimeters and three and a half, uh, three to six centimeters of water pressure of pleural changes just to have quiet breathing. So these two, quiet breathing, quiet, keep her quiet. And then six to 10 centimeters, uh, we'll call this forced breathing. <laughs> Okay, so here is the mechanical ventilation preview. Okay, so when we have to put someone on positive pressure, when we have to force gas into their lungs because their diaphragm is fatigued and their respiratory muscles are fatigued, what happens? How does that change all the stuff we've just been talking about? So a ventilator will force a breath into a patient. So that's why they're called positive pressure ventilation. So in this case, right, Alveolar pressure will increase above atmospheric pressure, right? Because we're forcing gas in. So that's going to make it super atmospheric on inhalation. Now, during normal circumstances without a machine, the alveolar pressure is less than atmospheric pressure. Well, it's reversed with positive pressure ventilation. That means we're going to reverse that. So that means alveolar pressure is going to be positive compared to atmospheric pressure. Pleural pressure is going to increase above atmospheric pressure also. Normally, pleural pressure is supposed to be negative, right? It's supposed to be a vacuumous container, right? That vacuumous space in between the, the rib cage and the, and the lung tissue there. But it's going to increase because we have expansion of the lung, right? Imagine, if you will, like here is a box. And here is the balloon inside the box. As we expand the balloon inside the box and make that balloon significantly bigger, we're going to squeeze and make that that pleural space smaller. And therefore, as as the volume decreases, pressure increases, right? That's why pleural pressure will then increase above atmospheric as well. And the diaphragm gets pushed out of the way. It has nothing to do with this, right? We actually force the diaphragm down during inhalation. We force it down. The diaphragm doesn't do it itself. Why? Why do we do this? Well, if we force the diaphragm out of the way, is the diaphragm still working as hard to move the chest wall? No. We're actually letting that skeletal muscle relax and recover, which is most likely what happened why this person's on a ventilator. I hope that makes sense. We're letting the diaphragm recover from all that stuff. So with positive pressure ventilation, alveolar is above atmospheric, pleural pressure is above atmospheric, and then the diaphragm gets pushed out of the way. That's the normal um, chain of action for positive pressure. What about how someone exhales on a ventilator? How, what, what goes on there? So alveolar, well then, as the breath has been delivered, we, we still tell the machine, give this much volume of gas and it's done. Uh, the alveolar pressure when the patient starts exhaling will then start to decrease towards the atmospheric to reach towards equilibrium. The pleural pressure as the lungs get smaller, as they get smaller over here, will 
will go towards their resting state. I don't know why the F is in there. Cross that out. Towards their resting state. The diaphragm will move back up to its resting level. So you can see how positive pressure ventilation does change the physics of breathing. And it changes a lot of stuff. We already talked about the mucosal escalator with positive pressure ventilation being uh, decreased. We, are, we talked about, uh, we'll talk about how surfactant is decreased. We'll, we'll talk about how uh, only certain areas later on, we'll talk about how only certain areas will open and close because they're just the path of least resistance when people are, are doing this. So it's a big difference when we move from your normal negative pressure breathing to using a machine with positive pressure breathing. And I do expect you for exam two, to know this slide, to know the changes that occur with positive pressure ven ventilation because this will be a key area in respiratory therapy because what one of the most common things that a respiratory therapist does is be involved with mechanical ventilation, right? If you plan on working diagnostics, uh, you plan on working uh, home care, all this stuff, it's still important that you understand this because the physics, they never they never change because you still have people that are on ventilation ventilators at home. You still have people that need that need to be troubleshooted that will come into diagnostics um, for diagnostic procedures that are on positive pressure ventilation. So even if you plan on never working in critical care, still need to know this. Okay, this is what it's showing you, just a different way of going over what we just talked about. We're creating positive alveolar pressure, right? So atmospheric pressure is out here. We have we're creating, we're pushing gas in with positive alveolar pressure here. Let's go to purple. Positive alveolar pressure. And that positive alveolar pressure then expands the lung tissue. And therefore squeezes the pleural cavity, causes the pleural cavity to increase right and become uh, super atmospheric pressure so now we have super atmospheric alveolar pressure we have super atmospheric pleural pressure and that pleural pressure and all that stuff expanding then pushes the diaphragm down and out of the way then for exhalation same thing the gas will stop flowing so therefore the gradient is still higher in the alveoli than the atmosphere so we have high alveolar pressure, high pleural pressure, and therefore everything will go to high to low. So therefore, it will go from here to here, right? Gas will flow out until we reach equilibrium. Okay, so take a break if you need to. But let's start talking about compliance. Compliance, both the lungs and the chest wall have their own compliance or elastic properties. We talked about this tug of war already between the the, the recoil of the lung tissue and the expansion of the thoracic cage. So how stretchy the lungs are, how willing they are to expand, okay? How willing they are to open up. So if you have a rubber band here that's in a resting state and you want to see how easily it goes from the resting state to the expanded state, we're looking at how compliant that rubber band is. So when we're looking at lungs, we're looking at the same thing. We want to see how easy is it go to go from a small alveoli to a fully expanded alveoli. So this is something that you will check every couple hours on someone that's on mechanical ventilation. We look at lung compliance because it can tell us how healthy the respiratory zone is, which is a big issue when someone's on life support. All right? If we compare alveoli to rubber band, uh, the more they stretch, the better, right? Right? Except for, you know, when we get to some extreme circumstances like emphysema, what happens to their elasticity, right? It gets destroyed with hyperinflation. It gets destroyed with that disease process. And therefore, their ability for the lungs to close back down, to exhale, to get rid of CO2 decreases, right? Their ability for them to get rid of CO2 is lower. And that's why their CO2 levels at baseline for someone with emphysema or with COPD will tend to be higher on those patients. They lose that elasticity, they lose that. Their compliance is good, their ability to stretch is really good, but their ability to come back to a small position is not good. All right, so compliance can be a big issue for everyone. <laughs> All right, so when we're looking at the compliance, this is equations. We're going to start getting into equations here. The compliance is the change of lung volume 
per unit of pressure. Okay, so if I give my lungs, um, uh, I want to see how much pressure it takes to get a certain volume in my lungs. So this is how return of investment is a classic uh, way of looking at this too. Uh, if I invest $10 in a company, right, pick a company, whoever you want. If I invest $10 in them, how much return of investment will I get after I give, invest my money into their stocks, right? How much return will I get for my money? And so compliance is seeing how much volume I get for a unit, how much volume change I get for how much pressure change we gave, right? So if the lungs take in a lot of volume, they stretch really easily, they have high compliance. In other words, for hardly any change of pressure, I got a lot of volume, right? For a hardly any change in pressure, I got a lot of volume. That means the lungs were able to expand very easily. Now let's say I gave the same amount of pressure and I got uh, hardly anything, not much, not much volume. Then those lungs are not very stretchy at all. They have low compliance. They're, it's like pulmonary fibrosis, right? Lung compliance would be like pulmonary fibrosis, where all that scar tissue develops, or pneumonia, where inflammation of the respiratory zone occurs. It's going to have low compliance. It's going to be very hard for that tissue to expand. With emphysema, where we've destroyed, uh, where we've destroyed all that elastic tissue, it's going to be high compliance. It's going to be very easy. To stretch and so I will have you guys calculate this this is something you have to use with mechanical ventilation so compliance normal compliance this is a normal value remember you do need to know normal values normal is 0.1 liter per centimeter of water so another way of looking at it would be a hundred mls per centimeter water pressure so these are our normal values you need to have those memorized I guarantee you that will be something I will ask you to recall multiple times. Uh, this means that 0.1 liters or 100 mLs of air into the lungs for every centimeter water pressure change, okay? So let me ask you this. If my compliance were at 0 0.05 liters per centimeter of water, right? So if I give a person, we put a person on a machine, and we push in one centimeter water pressure, and we only get 50 mLs, right? That's what we're looking at here. We only get 50 milliliters when normally we would get 100 milliliters out of them. What happened with their compliance? Did you get a lot of change? Did you get your normal change, which is 100 mLs? Did you get 150 mLs? Or you, did you only get 50 mLs, right? You only got 50 mLs per centimeter water. In other words, your compliance or your return of investment was very, very low, right? So that's a low lung compliance altogether. And so that's very stiff. That would be like pulmonary fibrosis or pneumonia, right? So increased compliance means the lungs are stretchy, they're loose, they'll accept a lot of volume, they get, they get stretched out. Emphysema patients can easily have this happen. Well, why? We talked about this, right? They lose that elasticity, they, they break capillaries because their, their respiratory zone hyperexpands. A low compliance means the lungs are stiff and they, they, they won't accept hardly any volumes, right? And this is a classic case of something like pulmonary fibrosis. Well, why would this happen, right? That pulmonary fibrosis could be scar tissue that develops from uh, inhalation coal dust, right? It could be from an asbestosis. It could be from uh, 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 an arthritis, uh, uh, autoimmune disease that can ultimately create pulmonary fibrosis that we're looking at here, right? The body can ultimately attack the lung tissue whether it's a known attack or an unknown attack and cause this to happen. So pulmonary fibrosis patients, you can see this happen. Pneumonia would cause a decreased compliance as well. Viral and bacterial pneumonias, they will decrease compliance. It'll be a lot harder to get that lung tissue to expand. So it's important that we trend lung compliance, especially when we talk about mechanical ventilation, because then I can see if my lungs are getting healthier or if my lungs are getting sicker and we need to do different interventions. So let's practice, all right? Here's a little math practice. Don't you love math practice? I hear a lot of groans out there. So this is the change in volume over the change in pressure. So if I have a pressure change of five, right, centimeters of water, 
and I breathe at a tidal volume of 0.5 liters. So that's 500 mLs. And you don't have to use it in milliliters. Uh, you can use it in liters if you want. Uh, what's my lung compliance? Okay, so 0.5 or 500 mLs over 5 equals 0.1 liters per centimeter of water, which if we convert it would be 100 mLs per centimeter of water pressure. So is this lung compliance normal, high, or low? Sounds like I'm going to be asking you to do this on the exam too. If my lung compliance, A, to calculate it, and B, to interpret it, tell me if my lung compliance is normal, high, or low. Well, in this case, we know normal is 0.1 liters or 100 mLs per centimeter water pressure. So in this case, your lung compliance is normal. All right, another one here. Uh, three hours later, if we go into that patient's room and they still generate a pressure of five, right? So their pressure change is five, okay? We did, we're we using the ventilator. We have it set at the same pressure change, right? The driving pressure is still five centimeters of water pressure. And they breathe in 0.25 liters or 250 mLs of gas, okay? So is that breath bigger or smaller than the previous one, right? The previous one was 500 mLs. This one's only 250. So we get less volume for the same pressure change. Okay, just mathematically, without even calculating it, just thinking about this breath being smaller compared to the same pressure change, we know that the lungs got stiffer, right? So what is my lung compliance? Well, here's the math, right? Will equal 0 0.05 liters per centimeter water pressure or 50 mLs per centimeter water pressure. So, what's a normal lung compliance? A normal is 100 mLs per centimeter water pressure. And now our compliance actually got cut in half. We only have 50 mLs per centimeter water pressure. So, these lungs are getting stiffer. So, that means their pneumonia is getting worse. Something's getting their lungs to be stiffer, right? It could be fluid building up, something like that's making it harder for gas to expand uh, in their respiratory zone. Hopefully, this is starting to make sense to you. So, on the exam, exam two, I will expect you to calculate lung compliance, right? Here are some examples, and your workbook also has examples as well. And there's worksheets, I think, that are on there as well. Uh, uh, calculate it. Tell me if it's normal, high, or low. And then give me a disease condition, right? So I just gave you a condition that would cause low lung compliance, like pneumonia, right? Okay, three hours later, right? The same patient, man, we're, we're, we're keeping a close eye on them. I generate a pressure of 10 centimeters of water pressure. Because they were getting such a small breath the last time, I had to go up on my pressure, right? And because I went up on my pressure, I'm gonna see how much volume I get for that. And I'm getting 500 mLs per centimeter H2O. So, what is my lung compliance now? Oh heavens. Well, even though we did change our driving pressure here, we changed the, instead of five centimeters of water pressure, we changed the driving pressure to 10 centimeters of water pressure. Did the lung compliance change? No, right? We are expanding the lung tissue more. However, the lungs are still at 50 mLs per centimeter water pressure. So has my lung compliance increased, decreased, or stayed the same? Well, it's stayed the same, right? I still only have 50 mLs, right? per centimeter of water pressure. So even if we change breathing machine settings, like right, the ventilator settings, we'll still be able to tell how sick or healthy that lung tissue is by looking at compliance as one of our factors. Okay, what does Hooke's Law have to do this? Yay, physics, right? Hooke's Law says that when a substance is acted upon by one unit of force, it will stretch one unit of length. So one unit of force equals one unit of length, okay? Two units of force, 
should be two units of length. Sound good, right? It's that one-to-one -one relationship there. If we're getting to the point where we're exceeding the stretching of that unit, right? Then we're not going to respond in distance or length in this case with the one-to-one -one relationship, okay? So if I have a balloon over here and it's mostly just like sort of a loose, unblown up balloon. Okay, for one unit of force that I blow into that balloon, I'll get one unit of balloon expansion, right? So I'm progressively getting bigger. Okay, now I'll give two units of force, right? And I'll get two units of expansion. However, if you blow up a balloon and you get to the point where it's almost ready to burst and you blow gas into it, are you gonna see a big change in the volume? at that point well once you reach that maximum stretching point you're you can use one unit of force will not equal one unit of stretch and at that point the substance will break will cause a hole to burst uh, forth in that balloon and then it's it's done right so when we're looking at Hooke's law let's pretend that this balloon is now an alveoli let's pretend it's the respiratory zone so for every force of ventilator pressure I push in on someone it should equal one force or compliant use of rate okay so I should expand a little bit of volume for each amount of force I go in. Now let's say you turn up the breathing machine driving pressure. So like the last example, we went from a driving pressure of 5 to a driving pressure of 10. So I do that, I increase my driving pressure, and if I do so too much and I don't see a change in my volume, then I could be getting to the point where it could cause a hole in the lung tissue, right? It could cause a pneumo thorax. So this is the picture, the Hooke's Law picture, right? So one unit of force should equal one unit of length. That's what you're looking at on this axis from A to B here. Until you reach a stretching point, and that's what it's showing this coil as a stretching point, we could double that force or we can make that force uh, higher, but we're not going to get the same amount of length, right? We're not going to get the same amount of stretch until eventually it breaks, and that's what happened here on letter C. So we reach a plateau is ultimately what happens. Well, we're not going to get as much return of investment. And at that point, we're getting close to the lungs rupturing. So this, when we put someone on a ventilator, we need to be cognizant of if we're getting a volume change that's increasing, or if we're, get, we're getting hardly any volume change at all, then we probably need to stop doing that because we could cause a rupture. And that's why people with really sick lungs that go into ARDS or bad viral pneumonias uh, will use lower volumes on their breathing machine because we don't want to rupture their tissue. We don't want to cause bad things and overstretching and trauma to their, their respiratory zone. All right, so if we look at the lungs, right, an increase in pressure, increase in volume until the elastic limits of the lungs are stretched. If we were to keep going, we'll cause that rupture in like a pneumothorax, like what I was saying previously. So elastins is something that we'll mention here. Elastins is the opposite of compliance. Compliance says, how easy is something to stretch, right? How easy is something to go from a small balloon to a big balloon, right? That's compliance, okay? Elastins is the opposite, is it? How easy or what is it, what's the relationship between it going from a big balloon to a small balloon, right? So this would be, over here, elastins, and then over here, this would be compliance. So you see how they're looking at, one's looking at um, how easy it is for it to expand, which is compliance, and elastins would be how easy it is to collapse back in, right? So elastins, of course, the easy thing with this one is it's just the inverse uh, uh, equation if you're looking at calculating this, which I won't make you guys calculate it, but this is the change in pressure over the change in volume. So we could see how easy it is to snap back or the elasticity of the lungs. So if someone has severe emphysema, in theory, we could actually calculate their elastins and sort of see how bad their elasticity has gotten. Right? If we have increased compliance, that would mean we have 
decrease elastins. What does that mean, right? If our compliance, so if it's really easy to go from a small balloon to a big balloon, it's super easy, right? We have increased compliance. That means there's not much resisting that volume change. That means it's very easy to do that, which means the, the thing that opposes compliance would be elastins, right? That's what keeps it in check. And if someone has really compliant lungs, that means that their elastins is really low, right? This is an inverse relationship between compliance and elastins, okay? So if I have emphysema, I've destroyed a lot of elastins, so they're gonna have high compliance. What opposes my lungs from expanding? Elastins, right? So if I have high compliance, I have low elastins. If I have high elastins, okay, so elastins is the ability to go from large to small, okay? If I have high elastins, in other words, my lungs want to shrivel up and close really good, right? Really fast. So I have high elastins, right? If I have high elastins, that means my compliance or my ability to stretch is decreased. It's something like pulmonary fibrosis can easily be the case here. But where the lungs are very scarred up, they're going to want to close almost all the time. It's going to oppose them from being stretched. So you do need to remember that if I have high compliance, they have low elastins, or if they have low elastins, they will have high compliance, right? So increased compliance like we talked about, emphysema, right? Loose floppy airways that are destroyed, don't smoke, <laughs> the loose floppy airways that are destroyed, we're looking at high compliance and low elastins, and it makes it harder for them to get rid of CO2 out of their bloodstream. Uh, if we have something like pulmonary fibrosis or pneumonia, then their compliance is going to be decreased and their elastins is going to be increased. They're more prone to atelectasis. They're more prone to lung collapse and lower oxygen levels as well. So both of them are equally bad. So surface tension is going to be one of the primary things that we will be looking at here. Um, surface tension is the water molecules sticking together. We sort of already talked about this with Laplace's law a little bit previewed, but let's talk about it more here. So surface tension uh, is something that your alveoli have to deal with. Uh, this is what resists uh, the fluid, the water that's in there, can resist lung expansion overall. Remember, water molecules want to stick together. They are friendly with each other. So they're if the water molecules want to stick together, that'll force the alveoli closed. It'll cause the alveoli to collapse on itself. So this is the liquid gas interface right, that we're looking at here, and there's a strong force called surface tension that wants the water molecules to be attracted to each other. So the gas interface has the ability to cause complete alveolar collapse. So if we did not have anything that opposed this force, the, the surface tension force in our lungs, our, our lung tissue, our respiratory zone would be completely collapsed, right, because there's no cartilage to give it that structure. So when we're looking at this, so we're going to start looking at bubbles, right? So surface tension is the ability for water molecules to stick together. The bigger the bubble, the less pressure there is or the less, the further the molecules are apart, that means the less work they're going to have to do to stick together. In other words, the lower the surface tension. The smaller the bubble, the more surface tension there is. So Laplace's law. So Laplace's law is how distending pressure in the liquid is influenced. All right. So we're looking at surface tension over the radius or the size of the bubble. Right. Surface tension over the radius. So if I were to ask you in a future assessment document, which of the following is Laplace's law? You're going to say it's pressure equals the surface tension over the radius. Right. Surface tension over the radius. If I ask you about the one gas liquid interface or the two gas liquid interface that would be something separate because that's two right uh, one gas liquid interface is two times the surface tension of the radius if it's a two gas liquid interface it'd be four times the surface tension of the radius so you'd have that that bigger component to the surface tension so when we're looking at the lungs why, where does Laplace's law come into the lungs well surface tension will increase right? Surface tension increases 
when the distending pressure increases or if the surface tension decreases the distending pressure will decrease okay so these are directly related so if I have a uh, radius of a bubble here's the radius of a bubble so if the radius decreases so I go from big to small hopefully I need to work on my arrows if I go from a big bubble to a small bubble uh, my radius is decreasing the amount of distending pressure or the amount of pressure it takes to keep that bubble open increases so just because we went from a big bubble to a small bubble means I have an increase in pressure just to keep this open it's gonna be harder to keep that smaller bubble open than a bigger bubble right you guys know this if you try to blow up a balloon from a party pack right you're blowing up a balloon the hardest part of blowing up the balloon is the first part where the the rubber is closest to each other and it's not stretched out but after that bubble starts to descend or that balloon starts to descend then it takes less pressure right for that radius to increase well this is the same thing as that balloon gets smaller and smaller it's going to take more and more pressure just to keep it open because the water molecules are closer together and therefore they want to attract each other and collapse so you got to battle that with more pressure you're going to be like okay where does this come into play what's the application we'll get there okay so as the radius decreases, the distending pressure increases. So if the radius of the bubble increases, the distending pressure will decrease. They're inversely related. So, okay, I have someone here that has normal, open, healthy alveoli. And let's say something happens and they develop a pneumonia. Okay, pneumonia has been known to cause atelectasis or the lung tissue to get smaller because we have all this inflammation, all this other stuff. So it's getting smaller. So what happened to the bubble? It got smaller and therefore all the water that's normally located down in here because of condensation of breathing, all that stuff, uh, the water molecules are closer together. Therefore, they're more likely to cause alveolar collapse, complete alveolar collapse. Right, that surface tension, it's going to create a lot more pressure just to keep it that bubble open, even though the smaller it is. The more open that bubble is, the less pressure it's going to take. So where does this come into play? I have a person on a ventilator, and their lung tissue is pretty closed down, and I'm not getting a good return uh, of a breath when the machine's delivering a breath. I'm, I'm not getting, it's creating a lot of pressure for them to breathe, right? And it's it's not relating to getting a good deep breath in their lungs. So if I increase the pressure and I open up some of their lung tissue to where it's a larger bubble, right? If I re-expand that tissue, well then the amount of pressure it takes to keep that bubble open is decreasing. Therefore, I can decrease the amount of work the machine's doing and also decrease the amount of injury that the machine's doing to the patient as well. Isn't that cool? So there is an application for it, but you just need to remember bullet point part here that these are inversely related. So the bigger the bubble, the smaller the surface tension. The smaller bubble, the higher the surface tension, right? So if we have a lot of distending pressure, right? We have a lot of distending pressure when the bubble is smaller and a high distending pressure when the bubble is bigger. Right. This is a better picture, right? This showing a bubble where the descending pressure is only at five centimeters of water pressure compared to the descending pressure when the bubble's at 10 centimeters of water pressure. So you can see as we go from the five to 10, our descending pressure increased with the bubble decreasing in size, right? So we go from two centimeters to one centimeter in radius. And this is your lungs, four times the surface tension over the radius. So if I ask you about the places on your lungs, this is the one you would answer four times the surface tension over the radius because it's a two gas liquid interface. Whew, that's a lot to say. All right. So as we've seen, if I go from a two centimeter radius to a one centimeter radius, it's going to take a lot more pressure just to keep that bubble open. In fact, in this case, we had to double the pressure just to keep that bubble open. So that means if your lungs are almost collapsed, it's going to take that much more pressure initially to get them to re-expand. And once we get them expanded, then it will take less pressure to keep them open. Okay, so the bigger the bubble, the less pressure required to keep the bubble inflated. Right? This is the bullet point here. This is the simply stated. The bigger the bubble, 
the less pressure required to keep that bubble open, right? We talked about this with blowing up a balloon. Once you got that balloon halfway blown up, it doesn't take much to keep that balloon expanding. The smaller the bubble, like when you first get it and start to blow into that, that balloon there, the more pr pressure there is to require that to open up. So that's a big key component when we're looking at how the lungs respond with being collapsed and opening up. So there's something called critical opening pressure. So critical opening pressure uh, says that we have an existing bubble, not one that's being created or developed. The critical bubble, uh, critical opening pressure says with little change, right? Uh, ultimately, until we'll have a big change. So we'll have a uh, pressure of let's just do 5, 10, 15, and 20. Okay. So here I have a bubble at 5 centimeters of water pressure, and then I have a bubble at 10 centimeters of water pressure, and then I have a big bubble that creates at 15 centimeters of water pressure, okay? So critical opening pressure, once that's established, it will be directly related to the radius. So it's the high pressure with little volume change that's initially required to form a new bubble. So I have this bubble at 5, 10, and then at 15, I hit my critical opening pressure, right? It's how much it took to finally open or directly relate that radius to pressure change. Because I got no pressure changes at 5 and 10. But once I hit 15, that's when I hit my critical opening pressure. What about alveolar collapse? So this is also based on Laplace's law. Uh, the, the alveolar that's larger require less pressure to maintain than the ones that are smaller. So in your lungs right now, you have alveoli that are larger, you have alveoli that are smaller. So it's going to take more pressure to maintain that small bubble than there is the big bubble. So this one's going to take more pressure. more pressure for the smaller bubble. So that means your lungs, some of your lung tissue has a natural tendency to close a lot easier than some of your other tissue. In the apices of your lungs, the top parts of your lungs, they have a tendency to stay open all the time because there's more negative pleural pressure in your thoracic cage and your apices than there is in your bases, right? So this is gonna mean it's gonna take more pressure for the bottom parts of your lungs to open up than for the very top parts of your lungs to open up. Right, so higher pressure must be generated to keep the small ones open over here. Uh, why do we not have total alveolar collapse on exhalation? Hopefully, you know the answer to this already. FRC rib cage, right? We have that rib cage, that outward tug of war, uh, that actually pulls that and keeps it open. And we also have what's called the surfactant that helps um, battle Laplace's law. All right, so surfactant here is produced and stored in type 2 alveolar cells. We've already gone over that. 90% of it is phospholipids, 10% is proteins. And the whole thing here is to decrease surface tension. And the big molecule that I want you to remember is DPPC. DPPC decreases surface tension. In other words, all this ability for water to attract itself to itself it decreases that relationship. It, it makes it the water separate from other water molecules, right? It separates the water molecules altogether. So how does it do this? Well, it has hydrophobic and hydrophilic components, okay? So hopefully you went over this in science a bit, but hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So hydrophobic tails and hydrophilic heads. So Philic is love, like Philadelphia, right? City of brotherly love, right? So hydrophilic, and then phobia is like, phobia, like you have a phobia of spiders, right? <laughs> I don't, but maybe you do. Okay, so hydrophilic and hydrophobic, right? And so you have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. And so these surfactant molecules will actually repel water molecules away from each other. So it separates the water molecules and therefore decreasing distending pressure or decreasing the surface tension. Therefore we can have it make it a lot easier for someone's lung tissue to stay open. So PPC has hydrophobic ends and hydrophilic ends. Right, and it causes surface tension to decrease, 
right? And so the alveoli are small at exhalation. We're going to have a, a greater concentration of DPPC than if we're at end inhalation. So we're going to have greater surface tension reducing capabilities at end exhalation, which is where we need it the most when the lung tissue collapses to its smaller state. It's going to be more effective at end exhalation than end inhalation, so I'll draw a picture about that later on. <laughs> so Laplace's law states that the radius of the bubble decreases, the pressure re required to maintain the bubble increases, this is something we've already said, so not a new complex. Uh, so as we go from a big bubble to a small bubble, it's going to take more pressure, right, to keep this bubble open, right, that small bubble open, right, that's it, we've already said that. So that's all part of Laplace's law, right, that the surface tension increases, the per pressure required to maintain that bubble increases. So surfactant offsets. It battles Laplace's law. It helps neutralize Laplace's law in the case of our lungs, right? So uh, people, like I said before in a previous lecture, uh, people even use surfactants in lawn care to help the water molecules uh, penetrate deeper into the soil for the grass roots, right? So it's something that decreases surface tension and allows for those molecules to separate and to stick together, right? So it decreases the surface tension, therefore we may not have to use such high pressures to maintain the alveoli staying open. Isn't that cool? So the question then is if we have someone that's premature, like a baby or something like that, that doesn't have mature surfactant yet, we can give that baby surfactant once they come out, usually within 15 minutes of birth, uh, if they're premature enough, and we will give them a surfactant, and that can help offset how much pressure or how much work of breathing that takes for that little baby to do. This is a better picture that I was talking about before. So remember we talked about during exhalation that this is going to have more effect than end inhalation. So at exhalation, our water, our water molecules, so here you're looking at surfactant, right? These little um, hourglass looking things are surfactant, okay? So we have the same amount in our lungs at all the time, right? But notice as we're at end inhalation, how the distance in between, right? That's why we have this arrow over here. The distance in between is further apart, and therefore they're going to be less concentrated. Therefore, as the lungs are stretching, right, hydrophobic ends, hydrophilic ends, as the lungs are stretching and these surfactant molecules are spreading out, we're going to have less surface tension reducing capabilities. In other words, we're going to actually stop, we're going to increase the amount of surface tension the, the more um, those are stretched out from each other, which is good because that will protect the lung from overexpanding. But as we exhale, notice how much closer the surfactant molecules get together, right? So as the surfactant molecules get closer together, that means their concentration and their effect on Laplace's law increases, and therefore will reduce surface tension that much more, and therefore avoiding alveolar collapse. Isn't that crazy? So it works best on both end inhalation and end exhalation. So end inhalation, it's stopping you <gasps> It's increasing surface tension and inhalation to stop you from overexpanding and popping a hole, Hooke's Law. And then at end exhalation, it's stopping you from collapsing altogether, which would be Laplace's Law. It stops Laplace's Law, uh, so it stops that from collapsing altogether. In this crazy and awesome how the physics of the lungs work. So hopefully, like I said, you can speed this up, slow it down, go through it some more, um, and then hopefully we'll do um, some hands-on stuff later on. That would be my hope. So last slide here. What would cause a surfactant deficiency? Well, if a patient has a severe acidotic state in their body, we talked about this at the very beginning, right? If you're, if an organism has a pH that's outside of normal limits, it's not going to live very long. It's going to have a lot of issues. Um, so it's not going to create your type 2 pneumocytes aren't going to create surfactant to help do this. So that acidosis is going to be a, play a big factor. Same thing with hypoxia or hyperoxia. Those type 2 pneumocytes really are not going to want to play a factor in there. Atelectasis, so your lungs are already closed down. 
pulmonary vascular congestive and pulmonary edema, they're both sort of synonymous uh, with each other. Uh, that's why you see me draw that connection. This is where you usually have a bunch of fluid that's hanging out in your uh, respiratory zone from usually the bloodstream. And so that can decrease or dilute surfactant altogether. ARDS and IRDS, um, IRDS is no longer a thing that's a Please erase that if you can. Uh, ARDS, that was infant respiratory distress syndrome. Now it's just called RDS. So that's a, ARDS in a baby is called RDS. <laughs> oh heavens, we'll go through this in disease class, I promise. But ARDS is a syndrome where the lung tissue pretty much is spewing um, inflammatory mediators into the respiratory zone and creating scar tissue. It's a very, very bad syndrome. And a lot of things can cause that. And even um, the COVID COVID, the SARS-2, um, uh, swine flu did it, right? A lot of these different things out there can cause ARDS and therefore reduce surfactant, make it very hard to get the lungs to expand. It decreases compliance. Uh, so pulmonary edema, pulmonary emboli, where there's a usually a blood clot, right? There's a blood clot that's causing decreased blood flow into that area that there there's decreased blood flow into the area. Remember, your respiratory zone, how does it get its nutrition? The the type 1, type 2 pneumocytes, how does it get, to, get its nutrition? Well, it steals its nutrition from the blood flow that's going through the capillary. Well, if there's hardly any blood flow going through the capillary, uh, it's not going to have as much nutrition to make surfactant. So hopefully that makes sense to you. And therefore, their lung compliance would decrease. Uh, pneumonia, we already talked about that one. Uh, excessive lavage or hydration. This is why we try not to make sure they're overhydrated. Or let's say we have someone that's a near drowning victim and there's a bunch of um, water that gets caught into their lungs, right? There, that'll dilute the surfactant. So drowning, near drowning, and then even something like ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. This is something you as an RT can run as well. We take blood out of the body and we put oxygen into it and then we put it back into the body. Isn't that crazy? Um, so ECMO is a, a form of a life support that we can put, use on someone and usually this bypasses the lungs and that's what most most ECMOs do is they bypass the lungs. Um, uh, they either do venous to venous where they, we take it out of a vein, we drop it back into a vein or we do venous to arterial and we bypass the heart and the lungs. Uh, and that helps let the heart rest and recover as well as uh, oxygenate for the lungs if the lungs are destroyed. And so because we're, we're not putting as much blood flow through the lung tissue itself, we go back to this whole situation here where we don't give nutrition to the alveoli. We don't, we don't give the surfactant, uh, the ability to produce surfactant because we're not supplying any nutrition to the, the type 2 pneumocyte that creates surfactant.